tomorrow it is going to result in a situation where is it it is going to be what you call a prosecutorial nightmare and it is going to be a disneyland for defense councils every accused tomorrow is going to get out by saying that look your evidence collection itself is flawed because there were no forensic experts at, uh, to carry out the evidence collection so see, in a nutshell in one word do we have a potential mess on our hands absolutely and it is going to increase our litigation by 30 to 40% Hello and welcome to a special interview for the wire. The three new criminal laws came into force yesterday and today we focus on specific changes both in terms of the law as well as in terms of procedure. One of the key issues I should raise is have we enhanced the powers of the police at the cost of the rights and liberties of citizens? Joining me to answer that question as well as many others is one of the most highly regarded advocates of the Supreme Court Nipun Saxena. Nipun Saxena let me start with a general question before I come to specific details. The home minister has said that the three new criminal laws which came into force yesterday are needed to decolonialize India's criminal laws. In your opinion has that been done? or have many or most of the old laws been retained but simply their section numbers changed first of all thank you karan for having me uh yes i believe that there has been a change in some form but that change is only to the scheme the chapterizations of most of the laws are kept the same the provisions are almost 95% of the provisions are the same in fact even the placement of the provisions are the same right so that makes one wonder whether there really is any meaningful change now to answer your first part of the question which is whether there in fact was any coloniality involved in the laws the answer is very simple there was no colonial hangover as if it were just to give you a brief context to why this is so you see the code of criminal procedure was 1894 which is the procedural law that governs the ipc was of 1860 and the indian evidence act was 1870 now when the new when india gained independence in 1947 there were law commission reports which sat down to identify the pr the problems with the so called colonial hangover in the system so words like british india dominion etc were done away with all these law commission reports and there were almost 6 in number set down meticulously examined every single provision to the t and came out with what you call a revamped indian law in fact the crpc thereafter required a holistic change and therefore the 31st the 32nd the 35th 36th 37th law commission set down and after 13 years of consultative deliberative process they came out with the revised indianized version of crpc in the year 1973 similarly there were various provisions of ipc and evidence act in fact to give you an empirical figure the ipc was amended at least 75 times since its inception even the crpc which was only brought in 1973 was amended 18 times and the evidence act was amended 26 times post independence so then is there really any coloniality left to be addressed was the question now this is only when i am talking about the amendments that i have just uh, brought to your notice are the amendments made by the indian parliament i am not even going into state amendments which run in hundreds just to give you an instance madhya pradesh state legislative assembly because they were increasing problems with dacoity came out with their own independent act called the mpdvk act which specifically focused on uh, dacoity problems right so every state had their own specific amendments being brought so it was as indianized as it could get by the time these laws came into picture so in a nutshell what you're saying 
is that the decolonialization of the three old criminal laws had happened. There was no need to do it again. It was already Indianized, so to speak. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't have put it better. And the second thing you're saying is that many of the provisions, up to 90-95% of the provisions of the old laws have reappeared in the new laws. It's just their positioning may have changed. That's right. In fact, I would go to the extent of saying even Macaulay would have said, this is my adoptive child. It's as close to the original as that, that even Macaulay would adopt it as his child. That's true. Okay. Now, last month, with Indira Jaising, I discussed how we could end up with two parallel legal systems functioning together for decades, how there could be a huge increase in the backlog of cases, and how there could be a worrying confusion over whether procedural laws apply retrospectively or not. Today, with you, I want to look at specific sections of the new criminal laws, which you discussed in your leaflet videos. First, there's a lot of concern that police remand which previously could not exceed 15 days, now can stretch to 60, in some instances, to even 90 days. Is that the case? The Home Minister vehemently and forcefully denied it yesterday, but many people are still convinced that, in fact, police remand can extend beyond 15 days. So my question is, first, what's your opinion? And secondly, if it can extend beyond 15 days, how worrying is it? Let's first deal with the middle part of the uh, question that you raised about a certain speech being made on the floor of the parliament to justify laws. You see, Karan, it's a principle of law that speeches made on the floor of the parliament have no value when it comes to interpretation of the statute. We have to look at the law as it stands. Right Now, in my leaflet articles, I have specifically mentioned the distinction between the old regime and the new regime. Now, what was the old regime? The old regime gave us a procedural safeguard. Any accused who was detained had to be produced before the magistrate first. And at that point of time, the police will seek what you call police custody. Elaborating further, there are two types of custody. One is called what you call a police custody. And second is what you call a judicial custody. Police custody means you have to keep a person in police lock up for the purposes of custodial interrogation. And judicial custody is jail, where a person is thereafter sent as an under trial by the magistrate. Right. So the discretion whether to give or not to give police custody is that of the magistrate. Now, what has happened under the old regime earlier was that there was a procedural safeguard or of a maximum cap of 15 days of police custody, not exceeding those 15 days. Now, where do we get that right. That right came from a proviso and it's very important. The proviso uses specific word custody otherwise than in the custody of police. Now this expression otherwise than in custody of police was under the old law. Under the new law this expression otherwise than in police custody has been dropped which basically now reads that if a person is is uh, sort of held captive or let's say is arrested or detained by police, he need not be uh, or the police custody need not extend to 15 days now because that otherwise then in police custody has been removed. So now effectively a police can seek custody for the entire duration when they are supposed to complete the investigation that is 60 days or 90 days. Any reading otherwise would be doing disservice to the intent of the legislature. Therefore, yeah. Can I interrupt Sorry. there and point out? Because yes. a critical proviso is missing in the new law compared to the old law, police custody can extend beyond 15 days, possibly, as I said, 60 days, maybe even all the way to 90 days till the investigation is carrying on. Now, why is this worrying? Why is it worrying that police custody can extend beyond 15 days, perhaps to 60, perhaps to 90? You see, Karan, uh, it's an open secret what goes on in a police lock in order to exert their desired testimony out of an accused. They would resort or the police officers are known to have resorted to police excesses. Custodial interrogation may also see instances and incidents of torture, which is why there were several procedural safeguards. 
and they only limited the time period to 15 days. In fact, it's also a judicially recognized principle. There are two separate Supreme Court decisions which said 15 days and no more. Anupam Kulkarni is a landmark judgment by the Supreme Court which says 15 days and no more. Now, if you extend this 15 days period to 60 days or 90 days, either together or in breaks, then you are giving sort of a the free right to the police officers to detain a person as long as they require. And in fact, that also has a very deleterious effect on somebody seeking bail. Today, one of the grounds of giving bail is that the police no longer requires your custodial interrogation. Therefore, there is no sense to keep a person in any form of custody and therefore the person must be enlarged on bail. Tomorrow, if the police were to create any reasons under the sun to say, sorry, I have to examine one witness who now for an FIR registered in Delhi resides in Kerala and I have to confront the accused with that witness for which I have to take for which I have to take a police custody beyond a period of 15 days that's going to be very very difficult and it uh, and the police can create any reasons to justify you see second so in a nutshell you yes. are saying the vehement claim made by the home minister yesterday that police custody cannot extend beyond 15 days is not true. The provision of the law is so devised that it can. Is that right? Yes, the provision The provision says so in so many words that okay. otherwise then in the otherwise how do you justify the omission of this particular expression? Now the new criminal laws have also created opportunities for the increased use of handcuffs, particularly for a new category of offenders called repeat offenders. Can you explain this point further? See, under Section 43, Subclause 3 of the BNSS, which is the Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sanhita, the police, for the very first time, gets the powers to use handcuffs. Now, very interestingly, Handcuffing was never there in CRPC, even under the so-called colonial laws. It is a new innovative inclusion in the BNSS. Handcuffing until now was only in the police manuals. Certain provisions of those police manuals were challenged as long back as, as in 1980 before the Supreme Court. Justice V. R. Krishna Iyer in his fantastic erudite style remarked that this is akin to putting a person... Uh, in shackles. In fact, the liberty of that person would be shackles because a person still enjoys what you call presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Now, if you were to parade an under trial prisoner in broad daylight, take them to the court and back, it was, uh, it was an affront to the dignity of that individual. Therefore, handcuffing was uh, held to be in rare and very exceptional circumstances. Say somebody is uh, a history cheater, somebody has committed heinous crime, so somebody has a tendency to disrupt the court proceedings if produced. It is only in those rare and exceptional situations uh, and it has to be on the order of a very senior police officer to uh, order such handcuffing. Now the difficulty here with handcuffing is it also includes who can you handcuff. It says habitual offenders, certain category of offenders and repeat offenders. Now, this expression repeat offenders has no judicial meaning because this has not yet come up for the purposes of interpretation by any court in the country. Habitual offender is somebody who is defined under the Habitual Offenders Act of having committed or of having been convicted under two or more offenses. But for a repeat offender, there is no such judicial interpretation. So repeat offender, in my estimate, could also mean any person against who, let's say, a domestic violence dispute, uh, a, a female decides to file cases against her mother-in-laws and father-in-laws under, say, a Section 12 or Domestic Violence Act, a 498A complaint, uh, a dowry prohibition complaint, three different FIRs are registered. Does it now mean that they would be included within the definition of repeat offenders? That would mean, you know, very old, aged people being paraded in handcuffs. And this means that the category and the number of people who can potentially be handcuffed has increased very sizably under the new law. Absolutely. And this expression is so vague that it, the potential of misuse is immense. And you see, Karan, you can have the luxury of having vague provisions in any other law, but not criminal law. Because if in criminal law you have a vague provision, then the possibility of its arbitrary exercise increases Tenfolds. Absolutely. And the, and the, net words, result, 
the more vague the provision, the more it's liable to be misused. I understand that. Now, third, the new criminal laws create a category of witness called voluntary witnesses. Apparently, this is different to police witnesses, and you believe this is another cause of concern. Can you explain? I believe that there were two categories of witnesses that you had earlier under the old regime. There was somebody called a police witness whose statements were recorded under Section 161. Now, interestingly, a police witness's testimony was not uh, uh, admissible unless and until that testimony was corroborated subsequently during his deposition in court. When I say testimony, it's not a testimony in the strict sense made before the court, but it's a statement given to the police. Therefore, the person was not even required to sign. And if he were to say recant from his statement subsequently, the courts cannot hold him liable in that sense. Right? He would not be opening himself to, let's say, a charge of perjury. Because even, Macaulay, even from the times of Macaulay, it was known that police can field or implant people at the drop of a head. And therefore, any statement given to police was inadmissible. The only second category of uh, admissibility was when a statement was made to a magistrate under section 164 of CRPC. In that scenario, the magistrate had to examine the person as to the fitness of that person to be able to give that evidence and thereafter record that evidence and even read out that evidence to the person to say, look, is this what you have said? And only thereafter, it could be admissible as evidence. Now, under the new regime, all of that has been uh, retained but a sinister inclusion has been made of somebody called uh, a free will or a free voluntary witness. Now, this free willing witness is hitherto unknown because the rules of evidence do not account for this new category. Is their testimony admissible? Is their testimony not admissible? That lacuna is left in the evidence act. So, while you have incorporated a new a uh, category of witness, the difficulty now, let's look at the trouble that arises out of this. The trouble is, you can have fly-by-night witnesses drop in cases which are weak cases, where the police can now bring in new witnesses whose testament, uh, whose evidentiary value is uncertain. So therefore, these witnesses can fill the gap of those witnesses which were police witnesses. These voluntary witnesses will now step into the courtroom and say whatever they have to say without being run over by the provisional or the, or, or the safeguards which are there in the Evidence Act, namely that their evidence itself is uh, not admissible unless and until corroborated. Now, the new laws also identify a category called proceeds of crime. And this would allow the police to attach property which is defined as proceeds of crime. Am I right in saying this is a power that previously was reserved for magistrates and courts, now it's been given to the police? And therefore, is that another reason of concern? That's right. See, attachment is a very serious exercise. When you attach somebody's property, you are essentially, that property might be that person's home, that property might be that person's office or establishment. And uh, attachment of that property for whatever number of days will deprive that person of enjoying that property. Right Now, in CRPC, such attachment was very rare and it was only exercised by judicial members. For the very first time, a police officer has been given powers of attachment. Now, another relatable provision, I am looking, looking at an extreme example. Let's say, take the PMLA Act. Under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, under Section 5, only the Director of Enforcement Directorate has that power or a Deputy Directorate of Enforcement Directorate had that power and that attachment was a provisional attachment for 180 days. And that Director or uh, provisional, uh, uh, in order to carry out that provisional attachment, had to have a material on the basis of which that provisional attachment was made. For that, even in a scheduled offense, charge sheet had to be filed. So, the stay the state at which attachment is to be carried out was there. Who can carry out that attachment was there. There has to be material on record for the purpose of attachment to be carried out. And all of this was within the oversight of judicial functions. There was a tribunal which was there. And if that attachment order had to be challenged, it can go before an appellate tribunal and thereafter before high court. Right. So there was an entire court. So even when with 
a very serious power of attachment there were judicial uh, you know procedural safeguards in place under pmla but nothing of that sort exists under the bnss so you see what you have done now, right now is you have implanted provisions of pmla into the bnss and conferred powers of attachment on police officers this is particularly worrying because now as i hear the answers you've given me to the last four or five questions there's another question that will occur to the audience and i want to put it to you directly police remand can now happen for longer periods the police can literally conjure witnesses out of nowhere and call them voluntary witnesses without any safeguards applying to the testimony they give handcuffs can be used for repeat offenders at the discretion of the police and the police will decide what is or what is not a proceed of crime and whether it should be attached therefore do the new laws take us somewhere towards some sort of police state if that's the right phrase suddenly the impression you've given is that the powers of the police have been enhanced so considerably at the cost of the rights and liberties of citizens that were tilting heavily towards becoming a police state one makes one wonder karan if the legislation even the words of the legislation do any service then is the nagrik really surakshit under the bhartiya nagrik suraksha sanhita you see let me give you another extreme example on police remands suppose a police remand uh, like i already told you could now extend to 60 days or 90 days let's take extreme examples under the uapa the unlawful activities prevention act which deals with terrorists there a police remand can be taken for up to 30 days but at the end of the 30th day the officer has to now file an affidavit before the court personally seeking why he needs more custody none of that none of those safeguards are here even under the ndps act under section 36a when a particular police officer takes somebody's judicial remand he has to file a charge sheet within a period of 180 days but yet police custody cannot exceed 15 days but under bnss the police custody can go well beyond 15 days to 60 to 90 days i will let your viewers be the judge of whether it does result in police state but the but the indicators seem to suggest so okay that's such an important sentence i'm going to underline it the indicator seem to suggest that we are tilting very close towards becoming a police state where the police have got enhanced powers at the cost of the rights and liberties of citizens and in any democracy but particularly in a democracy that considers itself the mother of democracy this should be very worry at this point nipun saxena let's come to two points in your leaflet videos which you've identified as potential good points but you still have concerns about them but here i'm going to ask you to go through the answers quickly because we are close to running out of time first there's the requirement for video recording of searches and seizures can you explain why this is potentially good but why you also have concerns about it so it's a laudable initiative with these searches and seizures to be electronically or digitally recorded under section 105 of the bnss now the police gets the power to carry out what you call an in depth uh, audio visual uh, inquiry as if it were while carrying out searches seizures and even arrests now that's that's very good part it's laudable initiative you must rely on audio visual interfaces because of the changing nature of uh, crimes that have been committed but one of the biggest problem is are do we have the institutional capacity to have that sort of thing are the police officers really trained you see the law was only passed on the 20th of december 2023 we are only in july these uh, standard operating procedures of carrying out searches and seizures have only been released 5 days back by the ministry of home affairs do you think that the police officers living in dehat thanas in all 731 districts in india would have the wherewithal and the institutional capacity to understand and to carry out these very intricate procedures of search and seizure mind you this time under the law when you are carrying out a search and seizure you also have to record a hash value do you think that the investigating officers would have the wherewithal to understand what a hash value is and how to generate it and now let's look at the consequence if you if this is held to be inadmissible because of 
the fault which has been carried out either deliberate or mechanical law by default, the net effect is that this particular piece of evidence becomes inadmissible, which so, leads to safe heaven for uh, defense counsels. So what you're saying is this is a laudable initiative, but it's far too advanced for the state of our police and their training and their capacity at the moment. That's right. Absolutely. Now, I believe, and I'll bring this up at this point, I believe important changes have been introduced regarding the admissibility of electronic evidence. How do you view these changes? That's a very problematic area because what happened, what used to happen was that primary evidence in context of an electronic or visual device was that device itself. You don't have to produce that device so long as you can create what you call a 65B certificate. Under the new Evidence Act, which is the Bharatiya Saksha Adhinayam, Section 57, which defines an electronic evidence, uh, sorry, which defines a primary evidence, that definition has been tinkered with. Now, any copies which are made out of the original electronic evidence will also be deemed to be primary evidence. Earlier, under the earlier law, it used to be called secondary evidence. Now, the difference between primary and secondary evidence is that secondary evidence is a feeble uh, type of evidence. It's not a very strong evidence. So, a secondary evidence can only be relied on if the primary evidence, let's say, is destroyed or is missing. Say, for instance, there's a sale deed. You have to take photocopies of this. You lose the original sale deed. You have to give notice. You have to seek leave of the court and only then you can introduce this. But under the new law, insofar as electronic evidence is concerned, a WhatsApp message, let's say, which has been seized by the police, transferred to XYZ three IOs. And in the meantime, the IOs keep changing. The fourth IO's uh, WhatsApp message will also be held to be primary evidence. Now, in a digital evidence, you know, Karan, it's so much possible for uh, tempering. And you cannot rely and you cannot call copies as uh, primary evidence because this is going to completely shift the equilibrium as if it were. So what I'm trying to say is that the very basic principles of evidence law have been fundamentally altered through the Bharatiya Saksha Adhinayam. Now, the second point that you consider both good and bad is the way the new criminal law treats proclaimed offenders and the fact that they can now be tried in absentia. Why is this both good and worrying? See, in one case, it is good because under the previous regime, what used to happen was that once there was a person who was a proclaimed offender, then the trial used to stop until and unless that person was apprehended. The trial, insofar as the others would proceed, but to him, that trial used to stop right there and then. Now, in that point of time, what suppose that person was apprehended after 20 years, most of the witness would have died. So there was nobody left to sort of implicate or accuse this person or stand in uh, court and, uh, you know, uh, bring home the charges against him. Under the new law, what has happened is, if a person is uh, held to be proclaimed offender, his trial will go on. Now, as and when he is arrested, he the trial will start from the place where uh, where it was continuing instead of the previous regime where the trial came to a halt altogether. So that's a good inclusion. However, uh, there's also a procedural safeguard. That procedural safeguard is if any important witness has been examined and the uh, and the accused wanted that witness to be cross-examined, then that, uh, that liberty could have been granted to him provided the witness is alive. Right? Now, uh, another good Part about now, this now, 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 now yeah. the accused can't cross-examine the witness because the witness may be dead. That that's one problematic aspect. What if the witness is dead? Can you now cross-examine him? You can't. In that case, how is that dead witness's testimony to be read to you? Is also another uh, area which may uh, sort of bring problems. But one very important thing is the accused cannot even file an appeal or a revision unless he first surrenders. So the I, the endeavor which is laudable is that the accused is being brought back to criminal justice system so that he can then uh, you know avail his remedies. So that, to my mind, is good. But the problem here is that the process is loaded against the accused, and remembering that the accused is innocent in the eyes of the law, not guilty, it's not going to be as in courts fair a trial as it otherwise might have been. Yes, that possibility is always there. Current, more so when there are, let's say, uh, witnesses who are already dead. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. 
Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Finally, Nipun Saxena, let me touch on four aspects of the new laws which the newspapers have highlighted. And once again, I'll ask you to give me short answers so that we can fit it all in. Right. First, by doing away with Section 377, there's no longer a law that criminalizes male rape. Do you believe this is an oversight and a mistake, or was it deliberate? Karan, uh, they say that there are uh, the number of offenses have been increased to 20, but yet this particular offense was left out. And the Supreme Court's judgment only decriminalized consensual sexual activities between to uh, uh, members of LGBTQ community. It did not say anything about non-consensual nature, which continued to be offense. So today, if there is an incident of bestiality, nobody can even register an FIR. And that because, is also true if there's an incident of male rape. You can't register yes, an FIR. even in that case, you can't register an FIR. So, so any, is, this, is this omission in your eyes deliberate? See, Karan, I... I don't see any reason why this would be left out. I don't see any reason why this would be left out otherwise. That's very clear. Now, Section 197 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sanhita talks about false and misleading information. Are you worried this is extremely vague and therefore it has the potential for grave misuse? Absolutely. It could be held to be void for vagueness. It would suffer the same uh, fate as if 66A of the Information Technology Act, which says whoever sends offensive messages, even that was struck down by the Supreme Court. So I agree with you. It is vague and capable of misuse. Third, there's a new specific law for mob lynching. But yes. has this been adequately drafted to properly cover the mob lynching of people accused of cattle smuggling, to take that one example? Yes. So for instance, uh, Section 103, if I'm not wrong, of the BNS now deals with this incident where five or more people kill somebody. Now, here there are two words which are very, very uh, opposite in their width and amplitude. You say five people acting in concert, but you then say having their own personal belief. Now, can five people have a similar personal belief? Who is to find out this personal belief feature which has now made its way into the law? is a very uh, difficult thing to prove in court. You see, because anybody's belief may and what goes on in a person's state of mind and its stomach is, is, is anybody's guess. Can I interrupt and ask you this? Is yes. this a case of poor drafting or is it a deliberate attempt to introduce a provision that actually undermines the intent of the law? At best, poor drafting. At the very worst, what you just said. So in other words, this so-called law that the government is so proud and has boasted about could end up being ineffective and maybe even impossible to implement. That's right. Today, as a defense counsel, I can stand in court and argue that X's personal belief may not necessarily be Y's personal belief. And therefore, personal belief is a very important criteria to be proven in court. And therefore, those people will be let off. Now, finally, the new criminal laws in certain specific cases permit community services punishment instead of time spent in jail or monetary fines. Do you welcome that? But side by side, how concerning is it that the law doesn't define what it believes community service should be? Let's clear a misconception first. It is not for the first time that community service is being introduced in Indian laws. The Juvenile Justice Act under Section 15 has it. In fact, the 
IPC Amendment Bill of 1978 categorically provided for a period of community service ranging from 40 hours to 1000 hours. Right? Even the Law Commission report of uh, 156th Law Commission had suggested community service. So it's not a new inclusion in that sense. There is, uh, it has just been left uh, undefined, uh, even under the BNS. Section 4F says community service. But what is this community service is unknown. There are only three or four offenses for which community service can be given. Let's say defamation cases, community service can be given. In case, let's say, is an incident of uh, a, a drunk misbehavior in public. In that case, community service can be given. So there is no, uh, you know, there are only three or four provisions. So I think they are, I think this inclusion of community service is what you call experimental inclusion. They want to see whether they want to extend it for other offenses going forward or not. But they haven't defined what they mean by community service. That's right. That's right. They haven't defined. Two quick questions before I end. You've right. just given me multiple instances where the three new criminal laws which came into force yesterday are inadequate, contradictory, lead to vague responses and lead to strange outcomes. Will all of this be challenged in court, perhaps all the way to the Supreme Court? And secondly, if such a challenge happens, do you personally believe it's likely to be successful? Most of these laws, I mean, there are so many lawyers who believe that most of these laws, which are the new inclusions, not the old ones, the schemes, right? These new inclusions, which may not exceed even 10 in number, uh, would be falling foul of some or the other provision of the Constitution, Article 20, Article 21, Article 22, Article 14, which is equality before laws. You see, so I have my, uh, you know, reservations that they would pass constitutional muster. But let's say time will tell what happens in the Supreme Court. Finally, until these laws are challenged and the Supreme Court has struck them down, they are the law of the land. They came into force yesterday. But the critical last question is, are the different police forces of our country fully conversant with them? Or as the Indian Express writing specifically about Bhopal yesterday, pointed out, is training inadequate and incomplete? Will policemen be at a loss, possibly for months to come? In other words, we've got new laws, but are the police conversant with them? Are they in a position to implement and understand them? Or will there be a huge gap between the law and the capacity of the policeman to implement and understand it? That's right. Absolutely. It's going to create a troubled situation. You see what we have done is that you have done away with laws that have been existent even prior to independence, which, uh, uh, and of course, as Indianized as they are. And now you have brought it out as a bolt from blue and have only given six months of preparation to all the police officers all over the country. In fact, there is a specific provision, and let me tell you why this is problematic. Section 176, subclause 3 of BNSS says, for any offenses which are punishable with up to seven years or more, you will now bring in external forensic experts to carry out evidence collection, say a soil profile or uh, you know mud test or whatever it is that may be required. But the onus to appoint these forensic experts has been left to the state governments. And the state governments have been given a period of five years, five years current, to bring out these forensic experts to the ground. Now, does that mean that from today till five years, crimes will cease to happen? Or that incidents in villages, etc. will not see situations where crimes are being committed and you require evidence collection? Will murders, rapes, sexual assaults, decoity, theft, etc. cease to exist? And all these provisions, of course, barring theft, are ones for which the imprisonment term is above seven years. Tomorrow, it is going to result in a situation where is it, it is going to be what you call a prosecutorial nightmare. And it is going to be a Disneyland for defense counsels. Every accused tomorrow is going to get out by saying that, look, your evidence collection itself is flawed because there were no forensic experts at, uh, to carry out the ev evidence collection. So see, in a nutshell, in one word, do we have a potential mess on our hands? Absolutely. And it is going to increase our litigation by 30 to 40%.
Nipun Saxena, thank you very much for this eye-opening analysis of the new laws and their provisions, as well as their infirmities and their inadequacies, and the problem that we could be left with without any easy solution. I thank you for the time you've made available to me. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.